Hi there, welcome to Exam AC 900, Microsoft Azure Fundamental Study Guide. This is episode 28, Defense in Depth Security. My name is Tim Warner. Our objective in the Azure Fundamentals AZ900 objective domain starts with Describe General Security and Network Security features, goes into Describe Azure Network Security, and our goal, as I stated, is Describe Defense in Depth. If you want to access the table of contents for this series, as well as hyperlinks to each video, point your browser to timw.info forward slash az900sg. Defense in depth is an infosec or information security term that Microsoft has really roundly adopted over the years, specifically for Azure. Defense in depth denotes a layered approach to information security. Look at the graphic on the right side. And by the way, I borrowed the graphic from the Azure documentation, and I'm going to give you the attribution at the end of this segment. Just wanted to say that. <laughs> but you can see at the center, that is at the bottom of that diagram, you've got your data. This is your most precious asset, isn't it, in Microsoft Azure? Your customer data, your application source code, and obviously you're going to keep that at the very center of your security. And notice that it radiates outward to the application layer, the compute layer, network, perimeter, identity and access, and physical security. And because we'll never go in the data centers that Microsoft has, some of this we have to trust the cloud provider. The good news is that Mark Rusinovich, the chief technical officer of Azure, is pretty transparent about describing how they handle physical security, perimeter, network, and compute security physically in those data centers. I would encourage you to, here on YouTube, do a search for Azure CTO, Azure Security, and you can find some of Mark's lessons. He's an outstanding teacher. I admire Mark Rusinovich just to a crazy degree, but you can learn a lot about defense in depth from him. So the ideas behind defense in depth is that you've got these layers and you're applying security controls at each layer. Now, like I said, Microsoft handles some of them, but you as an Azure customer, it's part of your responsibility to put in these controls that Microsoft gives us to protect what we do have access to in our Azure deployments. Principally, or to speak as globally as possible about this, our goal is to keep our information out of the hands of unauthorized party. Microsoft promotes what's called a zero trust information security model that I, of course, agree with, in which we never assume trust and always require validation. That is to say, we want to make sure that any access in our Azure deployments should only be by authorized parties. Another information security term is CIA, confidentiality, integrity, and availability, not the Central Intelligence Agency in the US. <laughs> and specifically, let me back up these bullet points a bit. Confidentiality refers to the least privilege principle. And what that means is that again, in Azure, you want to give your users enough privilege so that they can do their jobs, but no more. In your Azure hosted applications, you want to give your site visitors and your site users, again, the ability to do what they need to do in your application, but no unnecessary privileges beyond that. Integrity refers to data validation and preventing unauthorized changes. If you've ever heard of digital signatures, for instance, which is a mathematical checksum that can be used to protect data. And the idea is, let's say you're offering downloads to your customers. If you're digitally signing that download and a malicious person downloads a copy of your file, modifies it, maybe injects some malware, and then hosts it for download on their website, the users will see a hopefully very scary looking message that the identity of the software publisher cannot be verified. This sort of checksumming process lends to data integrity or preventing unauthorized changes to your data, application services, and so forth. And lastly, availability ensures that your services are always available to authorized users. And this, again, in a public cloud requires some trust, doesn't it? Because Microsoft does have unplanned maintenance events, or there may be a flood or a power outage of some kind that results in a denial of service as an outage on Microsoft's side. But the good news is that you have ways in the shared responsibility model to keep your services online, even if Microsoft has an unexpected outage. I'll have a little bit more to say about that in a moment. This, again, is a diagram a chart that comes from the Azure Docs that compares the defense in depth model with the CIA model. 
Let me just go through this quickly. Now, you don't have to memorize every element here for your AZ-900 exam. You need to be able to identify in general terms what defense in depth means and how that relates to CIA and the shared responsibility model. I'm going above and beyond because I'm that kind of guy. <laughs> so here we've got these layers in defense in depth classified as rings, with ring seven being physical security that Microsoft handles at the data center level. Identity and access, that's your responsibility in Azure Active Directory to handle user authentication, authorization, and accounting. At your network perimeter, there's distributed denial of service protection that Microsoft takes care of. In your virtual networks, you control network security rules that govern traffic flow in your VNets. Similarly, in infrastructure as a service, it's your responsibility to apply OS security and patches for your virtual machines. Now, in a platform as a service, you let Microsoft handle that. For example, with Azure Functions or Azure App Service apps, the underlying virtual machines are Microsoft's responsibility to secure. At the application level, this again is your responsibility to use SSL TLS encryption. This means applying your own digital certificate to your code and to your applications. And then finally, when we get to our data, that again, we get kind of some trickiness where it's a lot of trust with Microsoft. They tell us very explicitly that your data is always encrypted at rest in Azure. I've seen over the last couple of years a trend to where Microsoft goes one step beyond and lets you manage those encryption keys. I'll show you a bit more about that in our demo. This is a diagram that represents that shared responsibility model. We talked about this much earlier in this study guide, where on one extreme, your on-premises environment, you're responsible for everything with regard to security. As you're doing virtual machines in Azure, it's still mostly your responsibility. As you move into platform as a service, you're letting Microsoft handle more and more of that responsibility, but there's still stuff you need to do. And then that skews even more when you finally get to a managed or finished application in a software as a service model. All right, here we are in the Azure portal, and to illustrate defense in depth and the shared responsibility model, I figured that the general purpose storage account would be a good place to check this out. Let's go into one of my storage accounts. It doesn't matter which one. I'll grab this general purpose V2 account, and if I search the settings for encryption, I'll come to a setting called, appropriately enough, encryption, and it tells us here that a feature called storage service encryption protects all of the data in your storage account at rest, and that's it's a good assurance, but it's not enough for some businesses. And as I said a moment ago, we've seen a more recent trend where Microsoft, instead of insisting on managing the underlying encryption key that protects that data at rest, notice here that you can do customer managed keys. And even more conveniently, you can store the keys that involve your at rest data encryption in an Azure Key Vault, which You've, if you've been following this series sequentially, you already remember and know what Azure Key Vault is. That's a really nice convenience that Microsoft gives customers the ability to handle their own at rest keys. Nice. Now, let me do a search for properties. And here we can see the URLs that govern each of the services. So, for example, the blob service. Notice that the URL is https storage account name .blob .core .windows net. Now, secure transfer means that all of your calls into the storage account are encrypted, that the data is encrypted in transit, that these are all HTTPS. And you can actually force HTTPS in your storage account by going to the configuration blade and making sure that secure transfer required is set to enabled. That is your assurance that you've got data encryption going in transit. Now, as far as high availability goes, that also is done here in the configuration blade. There's various levels of replication. Locally redundant, Microsoft may makes three copies of your storage account in a single data center in your region. So that's going to protect you against failures in the data center, but it's not going to help if a data center goes offline. You've got GRS available, and in some Azure regions, there's a zone redundant storage option. Zone redundant puts your three copies of your storage account in different data centers in the same region. And GRS and RAGRS will allow you to have availability across regions. That is, if my 
home region were to become unavailable if Microsoft had an outage, I would be able to fail over to use the secondary region. So GRS and RAGRS are very useful to do that level of high availability and failover recovery. But note that while Microsoft gives you those controls, it's up to you to implement them, you see? Now, as far as least privileged security, that takes us into access control IAM, where you've got role-based access control. Let me do a search for Blob, for instance. Remember, least privileged security? In just the Blob service of the storage account, notice that there are four built-in roles that give various levels of access. If you just want to give an application or a person ability to read but not make any modifications, you can assign the storage Blob data reader, and that user would be able to read Blobs but not make any changes, nor would they have any access to the other three services that are included in the general purpose storage account, table, queue, and file. Pretty nice. There's also another authorization method with storage accounts. These are the API keys or access keys. Once again, although these keys are stored by default and managed by Microsoft, you can store them in Azure Key Vault and even instruct Key Vault to periodically regenerate those keys to keep them fresh. Lastly, as far as data protection goes, we can go to the data protection blade and turn on something called Blobsoft Delete. This allows your blobs, your binary large objects, or your files, in other words, that if you or a colleague were to delete those blobs, those deleted blobs will be retained between 1 and 365 days, depending upon how you set your policy here. This is excellent because you may have an inadvertent deletion or maybe a blob gets corrupted or infected with malware and you want to bring a previous version of the file back. This is a nice layer of security and protection. But yet again, the theme is Microsoft gives you the tools. It's up to you to make use of them. For learning resources, as I said, the graphics that I used in this slideshow were borrowed from Microsoft Learn, specifically their Design for Security free course. Really nice reference, by the way, timw.info forward slash DID1. There is a nice free white paper that Microsoft wrote covering defense in depth. You can download that at timw.info forward slash DID2. And Matt McSpirit, one of the Azure Cloud evangelists at Microsoft, a good teacher, a good presenter, did a seven or eight minute video on Azure defense in depth that I recommend you watch. That's timw.info forward slash DID3. For our next episode in this series, I'm going to be covering network security groups, or NSGs. That speaks with Azure Network Security, and moreover, that speaks to your responsibility in the cloud shared responsibility model. Thanks again for everything. Please subscribe if you don't already. My Twitter handle is TechTrainerTim. My plural site courses you can find at timw.info forward slash ps, and my website is techtrainertim.com. Thanks again. I'll see you in the next episode. Later.